quite a bit of money over there. <laughs> okay.
so much of who God is and what he's done for us and what he promises to do that we should continuously give God glory for today. And so this next song just is a song we just sing that's praise his name. Praise the name of the Lord my God. So let's give glory to him. And this song sings of all the things that he's done for us, of all the things that we should give glory for him every moment of every day in our lives. So let's put our minds upon him today and praise his name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus went and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. I see. Even let's bring all our problems and our struggles and our heartaches and all 
the strife and stress that's outside these walls, let's come today and give glory to God that in spite of all of that, he's still good.
set our eyes on Calvary. Remind us how nothing and no one in this life can ever take that truth and that life from us. May your goodness fill our hearts. May it fill our minds. May it fill our lives today. May it overwhelm and overcome everything else that we bring here in front of you. And may we realize all that we are in Christ Jesus to the glory of your name. We pray now that you speak to us loudly through your word, that we would come to hear more of your goodness and know more of your truth. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. In uh, 1874, uh, D.L. Moody traveled to England. He was a great American evangelist. He traveled over there to go speak at some of the universities. And the English people didn't think much of D.L. Moody. He was a very powerful speaker, but they, uh, they thought he was an uneducated American with a terrible accent. And so he first was at Cambridge. In Cambridge, they laughed and they ridiculed him the whole time that he was giving his sermon. But God was still good and God was still powerful and hundreds of students came to accept Jesus Christ through that. Then he was scheduled to go to Oxford. And Oxford and Cambridge have a bit of a rivalry. And Oxford heard what they had done the Moody. And the students there said, we're so much better than Cambridge, we can outdo them. They failed to put that American in his place, but we are going to succeed where they failed. So every time he would come up, and every time he would do anything, they would stomp, and they would shout, and they would jeer, they would laugh, they would make fun of him. And then finally, Moody got to the point of the service, got his Bible out, started to read scripture. And they started to stomp, and they started to shout, and he slammed that Bible shut. And he leaned over the pulpit. And he said, you all jeered at the hymns that we sang. And I didn't say anything. You all jeered during my prayers. And I didn't say anything. But now you jeer at the word of God. And I would rather play with forked lightning or the most deadly disease in the world than play around with God's word. He was making this point to them that playing with the word of God was like playing with fire. That when you you laugh at it, you ridicule it, you put it down, it is a dangerous thing. Those who who throughout scripture ignore the word of God or go against it, it leads to their destruction. They're playing with fire. Now, we would never do what the students at Cambridge and Oxford did. We would never openly laugh at, jeer, shout during the word of God, although I think there's some people today that would do that now. Yet the truth is, in our culture, we do the same thing much more subtly. It is forgotten. It is pushed aside. It is... Diminished, right? Just another book called something other than what it is. And yet, we're not just talking about the actual Bible today. The Word of God is, number one, Scripture calls Jesus the Word, right? We're talking about ignoring the Word. We're talking about the Word that became flesh and made us dwelling among us. The word that came us to show the way, the truth, and the light. The word that showed us who the Father was. The word that showed us how to love and how to live. He, just like scriptures, is diminished and ridiculed and put down and forgotten. We're talking about the will of God. 
God's words to us about how we should live and who we should be. When we ignore that, when we forget that, when we push it to the side, we are playing with fire. Our lives so often jeer at the word of God. How we live shows that we don't listen to or adhere to or value what God has told us through his word, through his son, to our hearts. And so today we are in 2 Kings chapter 1. And what we find is this. You have one of two choices. One, when we hear the word of God, when we hear God, what God wants from our lives, there's only two ways to go. One, we can adhere to it. We can accept it. We can allow it to control and be in charge of our hearts and lives and dictate who we are and where we go. Or we can live in open rebellion to it. Forget it, run away from it, ignore it, push it aside. There is no middle ground. You do not value the word of God, the words of God, or God's will, if you don't live by them and allow them to change your hearts and lives. With your life every day, you mock it. And what the story in 2 Kings is going to tell us is you are playing with fire when you do that. It will lead to your destruction. Today, we're going to see the story of King Ahaziah. This is Ahab's son. This is the only thing we ever really hear of him or know of him. It's not, very, not a very good image that we get of him here. But as we read this today, what we're going to see is Ahaziah goes out of his way to ignore God and to ignore God's will and God's word. And we're going to see how that leads to his destruction. And in how he does that, we're going to come back and recognize how we do that and how we can avoid that in our lives. So let's start today in verse 1. Again, 2 Kings chapter 1. It says, After King Ahab's death, the land of Moab rebelled against Israel. And one day Israel's new king, Ahaziah, fell through the latticework of an upper room at his palace in Samaria and was seriously injured. So he sent messengers to the temple Baal's above, the god of Ekron, to ask whether he would recover. But the angel of the Lord told Elijah, who was from Tishba, go and confront the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is there no god in Israel? Why are you going to Baal's above, the god of Ekron, to ask whether the king will recover? Now, therefore, this is what the Lord says, you will never leave the bed you are lying on, you will surely die. So Elijah went to deliver the message. So, Ahab has died at the end of 1 Kings. He dies during a battle, in disguise, trying to hide, but, but he loses his life. And his son Ahaziah takes over, and Ahaziah has an accident. Nothing happens, he doesn't do anything, he just has an accident. It happens in life, he falls through the floor, he's badly injured. So he wants to know, is this going to kill me? So he sends some messengers to Baalzebub, tells us the god of Ekron. Now, that name might sound familiar. Baal is not one god. Baal is many gods. There were many Baals. So this is just one of the gods of Baal that they worship. Baal-zebub is actually a Hebrew name. The actual name of this god was actually Baal-zebul, which means Baal the prince. Baal-zebub means the lord of flies. So it was a way for the Hebrews to kind of, later on, kind of knock this god and ridicule him. It is a name that in the New Testament is used to describe Satan. And that's where this comes from. So we've heard this term before. Ekron is a Philistine city. It was located between Judah and Philistia. It's nowhere near Samaria, where Ahaziah is. A whole different part, a whole different country, a whole different part of, of where they are. This is most likely a local god to them. Now, why does Ahaziah send messengers to this God? Well, it doesn't tell us, so we don't know. We can guess, right? Why would he send messengers to God? Hear what the God of Israel has to say, right? Three, he may not really have a relationship with that God. He may not know him. 
even though we should. We don't know why he chooses this God either. There's some uh, incantations that we have found from this time where they believe this God can heal and cast out demons of disease. But here's the thing. Ahaziah doesn't ask this God to heal him, does he? He asks for the future. He wants to know what's going to happen to him. So it's not even that he's asking for something from this God. He wants to know what's going to happen to him. He's asking for information. He trusts what this God has to tell him more than his own God. And God sees that as open rebellion to him. That's what we do know in all this. God sees it and he's not okay with it. And so he sends Elijah to go tell Ahaziah, why are you sending messengers to another God when I can tell you what's going to happen? Is there no God in Israel? I'm right here. Let me answer your question for you. Then we get to, uh, to verse 5. It says, when the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, why have you returned so soon? They replied, a man came up to us and told us to go back to the king and gave him this message. This is what the Lord says, is there no God in Israel? Why are you sending men to Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, to ask whether you will recover? Therefore, because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will surely die. What sort of man was he? The king demanded. What did he look like? They replied, he was a hairy man. He wore a leather belt around his waist. Elijah from Tishba, the king exclaimed. Then he sent an army captain with 50 soldiers to arrest him. They found him sitting on the top of a hill. The captain said to him, Man of God, the king has commanded you to come down with us. But Elijah replied to the captain, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and killed them all. So the king sent another captain with 50 men. The captain said to him, Man of God, the king demands that you come down at once. Elijah replied, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you and your fifty men. And again, the fire of God fell from heaven and killed them all. Once more, the king sent a third captain with fifty men. But this time, the captain went up the hill and fell to his knees before Elijah, and he pleaded with him. groups, but now please spare my life. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him and don't be afraid. So Elijah got up and went with him to the king. So first of all, Ahaziah is surprised because it returned so soon. Remember, they're going to Ekron. It's not in their country. It's a different place. 45 to 60 mile journey on foot and they come back right away. And Ahaziah discovers through a, a question that it's Elijah. It's kind of, the, the verse reminds me if you were a Seinfeld fan. Whenever something would happen to Seinfeld, and he would know it was his enemy, Newman, right? He would just, Newman, I knew, he knew it was him. He knows right away. It's Elijah. And he goes and he sends for Elijah to be arrested. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Why would he would even do that? But he does. He doesn't send himself, he sends 50, 51 men, right? And they all die. So he sends 51 more, and they all die. Until a captain gets smart and says, please, this, I'm just doing my job. The king has sent me and made me do this. And God tells him, don't be afraid. Go. Now, here's what I, one thing I want you to notice from this. Twice people come and say, the king, look at the word, demands you to come to him at once. And what's Elijah do? He sits right there on the mountain. And, and God says, Elijah, go to the king. And what's Elijah do? He gets up at once and goes. See, Elijah knows who his king is. Elijah's not going to respond to the word or the power of men. He responds to the word of God. That's what he allows to move his life. That's what he allows to tell him where to be and who to be. Then he goes to the king. Verse 16. And Elijah said to the king, this is what the Lord says. Why did you send messengers to Baal's above, the god of Ekron, to ask whether you will recover? 
Is there no God in Israel to answer your question? Therefore, because you've done this, you will never leave the bed you were lying on, and you will surely die. So Ahaziah died, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Elijah delivers the same message the king has already heard. And he's been unwilling to listen to the whole time. It's a question. Is there no God in Israel for you to go and ask this question to? And notice he says, therefore, because you have done this, you will not live. God could have saved Ahaziah if Ahaziah would have trusted it to come to God and ask for help. But he doesn't. He trusts in other gods. And because he put his trust in other gods and ignored and ran from and fought the word of God, he's playing with fire and it leads to his death. He could have lived. He could have had life. But instead, he chooses to ignore God and he dies. Notice, he dies because of this. He's asking, will I die from this accident? And God says, no, you're going to die because you've chosen not to trust in me. God's not going to kill him. He's just not going to save him because he never asked for that. Now, as we have been studying Elijah, every week we get into the will of God, one way, shape, or form. Every story is somehow this grand dilemma of whether you should follow God from praying for a drought to trusting ravens to feed you, to facing 400 prophets of Baal, to running away to the mountain of God. All this, Elijah is continually confronted with this idea of following the will of God. And then Ahab, the same way. And now Ahaziah, the same way. They're all confronted continually with following the will of God. And what we're seeing is all these different ways to respond to it. And the faithfulness with which they decide to either follow God's will or follow their own will is what decides the outcome of their lives. It doesn't decide whether their lives are easy or hard. It decides where their lives end up. Elijah's life isn't easy because he follows the will of God, but he never runs away from it. He always ends up where he needs to be. He's never the guy with fire falling down on him. He's on the other end of that every time. So here's the question. I think that we are more similar to Ahaziah than perhaps we'd be willing to admit. And here's why. Because when we get in these times of trouble, we so often fail to go to God, to go to His Word, to seek out His will. We want an answer. We want help. But sometimes we forget that God is there. He's usually our backup plan. I'm going to try all these other answers and try to do it my way first. And then when all else fails, God will still be there. And what Ahaziah shows us is that is the wrong strategy. That's the wrong way to handle the word and the will of God. So we're going to talk about four ways that I think we're like Ahaziah. Number one. Because we all, whether we admit it or not, we run from God. We run from God's will. We run from God's word. Maybe not all the time. Maybe not in everything. But in some parts of our lives, in some relationships of our lives, we just don't want to hear what God has to say. So number one, we run from God when we run to sources other than God. That's Ahaziah's real problem, right? He doesn't go to God. Instead, he goes to a different God. And God has shown time and time again throughout these historical books that we are in that he sees that as an act of rebellion. He has no tolerance or patience for his people, especially his leaders, trusting in other gods. And a lot of times we think, well, God, he's his God of love, right? He's a God of peace. He's a God of grace. He's not, he's not this God anymore. That's the Old Testament of God. Right? If two people were married and they say that they love each other and then one spouse decides I'm going to run off and live with somebody else as if they're my spouse. And you shouldn't be upset about that because you love me. Right? If you get angry, you don't love me anymore. Does that make any sense? No. 
because you love them, you take great offense to that, right? Because you love them, it angers you. You see that as a rebellion, not just against you, but against your relationship, against your marriage. And we are called the bride of Christ, friends. We are in the marriage with Christ. We will run to anyone else, anything else. We are saying to God, you love me, so you'll take me back. I can do whatever I want. I can go to whomever I want. And Ahaziah shows us that God is never okay with that. He's never going to accept that. Yes, he's patient, and yes, he's loving. But God, there are great consequences when we seek things other than him. Why do we do that? We do that because we don't want to hear what God has to say to us about that person, about that relationship, about whatever's going on in our lives. We do that because we, we actually trust the empty, meaningless things of the world more than we trust the word of God. We do it because we're searching for answers that fit what we want more than we're actually searching for truth. We do this because we attempt to use God. Have Him give us what we want. Have Him give us what we need when we want it and need it. God's on our schedule. But we think... We can move to the front and do what we want. And when we do that, we're running to things, to sources, to other gods, and we're ignoring the Word of God. The second way we run away is we Have you forgotten that I'm here? Hello. Still here. Still God. Why didn't you? I'm not like Ahaziah. You see, forgetting God is often very subtle. It isn't as um, known. It isn't as outlandish as us saying, I don't care if the God's ever going to go to somebody else. It looks more like this. Somebody comes home from work. It's been a hard day. You say, man, it's been a hard day. I need a drink. Now, just think about that for a second. What does that communicate? That communicates that I need rest and I need peace. And where am I going to find it? Not in God. It's not the only way. Man, I've had a hard day, and then you stop at the, the grocery store and you load up on all the junk food and you just eat all day to emotionally feel better. Pretend that social media is real and that's all that exists. You just turn on the television and forget. How many times do we say I've had a long day? I need to fall to my knees and pray. I'm not telling you that because that's what I do. Because I do the same thing that you do. But it's a subtle way. That we trust it in those times. It's not that these other things are bad in and of themselves. But when they come before God, when they take place of Him, when they are what we trust in to make us feel better, to bring us hope or peace or rest, then we've forgotten God. And God is looking at us when we do that and saying, is there no God in your house? Is there God in your life? Am I not still here? Have you forgotten what I can do for you? And we know, saying that he can do so much more than any of those things. And yet, day in and day out, we trust that more than him. It's not always that things are inherently wrong that make us forget God. It's us. Why does Ahaziah arrest Elijah? Because he wants Elijah out of the way so he can send his messengers with my plan, right? He doesn't want to hear God's message. He had a question, 
God answered it. He said, I don't like your answer. I would like a different answer, please. Let's get rid of Elijah. Now we saw how that went for him. And for the 102 men that he made go do his bidding, right? It doesn't work to ignore what God has to say to us. It doesn't change it. It doesn't make it less true. It doesn't make it less right. Ahaziah ignores what God has to say and what happens. What God said happened still happened. Whether he believed it, whether he trusted in it, whether he listened to it or not, God's word was still true. God's word was still right. God's word still happened. We sang today about Jesus coming back in robes of white. It doesn't matter whether you believe that's going to happen or not. It's going to happen, right? It's not about what you want to be true or what you believe is going to happen. God said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. What we believe or what we do with God's word doesn't change the truth. You can ignore it all you want. You can run to other things all you want. God's word is still true. Finally, we run away when we refuse to admit that God is king. What Ahaziah has done here is manipulate reality. He thinks he's powerful and he's in control. I didn't like this truth, so let's sweep it under the rug and let's go find me a different truth that I can believe in, that I can trust. When Ahaziah hears what God has to say, he could have remembered his father when he heard that he was going to die. What did his father do? His father tore his clothes and humbled himself and recognized what he had done wrong. And it didn't take away the consequences of all of his, all of his idolatry, but he lived. And God didn't pronounce the judgment on him right away. Ahaziah does the opposite. He digs in. He hears God's word and he says, I'm not listening to that. I'm going to get rid of it so that I can have what I want. Because Ahaziah thinks he's in charge. He's king. Elijah's the only one who shows in this story that they, he recognizes who the real king is, right? Who's the one with real power? Although maybe the third captain. I think maybe he gets it a little bit, right? <laughs> Ahaziah, we're like him, where we refuse to acknowledge that God is king. He has more trust in his power than he has faith in God's power. He believes more in his ability to control than he believes in the truth of what God says will happen. We are manipulating reality. As a scholar, Gina Hens Piazza, she says this, and she's writing about Ahaziah. She says, when we lose sight of the all-powerful God who controls matters of life and death, we are drawn to other false groundings for our hope. In turn, putting our trust in other false controls over our destiny can breed a misuse of power. Keeping such delusions alive not only leads to, uh, to using or sacrificing others for our self-interest, but can eventually cost us our own lives as well. Ahaziah's story serves as a witness. When we lose sight that God is the one who's in charge of life and death, when we start thinking that I can be in control of that, note she says, it leads to harm in other people's lives, right? Ahaziah does that, doesn't it? Ask the family of those 102 soldiers. And it hurts you. It doesn't work out for your own self-interest. He dies because of it. It costs us our own lives. You are not king. Not any point, not any part of your life. No matter how much control or power you think you have over something, you have none. It is an illusion. God is, always will be, always has been king over every part of your life. And the sooner you come to accept and embrace that truth, the sooner you come to accept and embrace that word, the sooner you get to live under his love and grace and peace and joy and all the goodness that he has for you. And the longer you fight against it, the more you're playing with fire and the more damage you're bringing to your life. Now, there's one important question we haven't answered yet. Because most people listen to this story, and they have one real big question. How do I become such a man or woman of God that I can call down fire from heaven
from the people who are messing with me, right? How do I get to this place like Elijah? Now, you might, you might think well, that's, that's silly. Nobody would ever think they could do that. Not true. Luke chapter 9. Jesus gets asked the same question. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. So they went on to another village. There's later Greek manuscripts that add, like Elijah. Should we call down fire from heaven like Elijah? They understood this as they believed that at some point in following Jesus, they could be like Elijah. And when people came and messed with us, fire from heaven was going to fall and consume them. That was a part of being in God's arm. This isn't like, they're not joking. They're not being sarcastic. They literally believe here that this is inevitably part of following Jesus. And Jesus rebukes them. And they're shocked. Because they, are they fighting for themselves? No, they're standing up for Jesus. Right? They're saying, Jesus, these people won't accept you. They won't even let you in their town. Let's blow the whole thing up. And they think that's totally justified. But why does Jesus rebuke them when they are standing up for him? Because they're like Isaiah. They're like Isaiah where they are ignoring the will of God. Jesus has set a different path before them. Not one of judgment and destruction. He has set before them a path of love and peace. And here they're ignoring that. God came and wanted to use them to save people, not to destroy people. But they want to destroy them. We get so caught up in this world today in this us versus them mentality and it's highlighted no, no more than it is right now in an election season where if people could, they would call down fire from heaven on another political party, right? We would destroy them and yet when we do that, when we feel that way, we are ignoring the word of God that tells us this, your fight is not against flesh and blood. Your fight is not against one another. It's not against people you disagree with. It's not against people you don't like. It's not against people who are even openly fighting against you or openly fighting against the word of God. Jesus himself would be shown the utmost disrespect. He would be undignified. He would be ridiculed. He would be thrown on that cross. And they even tempted him there, not to call down fire from heaven, but to call down angels from heaven to come and save him, right? Because he had that power. Because if he was like Elijah, he could do what Elijah did and defeat his enemies right there, right then. But that's not who Jesus came to be. He brought a different fire from heaven, one that they weren't expecting. When instead of calling on God to save him, he called on God and said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they're doing. That's the fire that you and I are called to bring. To the people who stand against us. And doing that, Jesus demonstrated God's greatest power in, the, in this world. Power, forgiveness, of love, and grace. He was not there to fight flesh and blood. And neither are we. He was not there to destroy them. So neither should we. He was there to build up. He was not there to live out the will of men. He was there to live out the will of God and nothing else. And nothing that anyone else ever said or did changed Jesus' path. He always just kept doing what God wanted him to do, no matter what people around him said or did. He was there to demonstrate what real power looks like. And it looked much different than it even did for Elijah. Jesus has called us to bless those who curse us and to pray for those who persecute us. That's the word of God, friends. That's the will of God. So if you are doing anything other than that with those who stand against you, you are being like Ahaziah too. 
You're James and John, and you want to call down fire from heaven. You want to call down judgment from God instead of following the way of Jesus. Jesus has called us to pray for forgiveness, to pray for them to stop running away from God and start running toward Him, to pray for them to stop ignoring God and start listening to His truth, to pray for them to stop forgetting that God is there and that His power and presence is in their lives, to pray for them to stop trying to manipulate reality so that it fits them and to embrace the reality that no matter what happens in this election season, our King doesn't change. The one who's in charge of all things will still be in charge of all things to the glory of God. That's what God wants us to do right now. What I want you to hear today is James and John were being like Ahaziah. They were seeking out what they wanted instead of following the path that Jesus clearly had laid out for them. And sometimes we think we're following God's path. We think we're fighting for Jesus. We think we're doing what he wants and we are doing what we want in the name of Jesus instead of listening to what he has for us. And perhaps it is in those relationships and in those places with the people you disagree with, the people you don't like very much, the people you don't get along with, the people you wish weren't in your lives anymore. Perhaps it's in those places that we are the most like Ahaziah. It's with those people that we are running away from what God wants because we don't want to love them. It's with those people that we are forgetting that we are gods, and so are they. It's in those places where that, with that person that we're ignoring the things in God's word that define how you should see them, how you should speak to them, how you should love them. Perhaps it's with those people that you are trying to get your way the most because you know what God has to say about it. And you don't like it very much. You want there to be a different way. Just like Ahaziah. If there's someone today that you really wish you could call down fire from heaven on, and maybe they deserve it. Maybe they don't. Maybe it's time for you to call down fire from heaven on your own heart. And on your own life. And ask for the Spirit of God to begin to consume you so that you see those people differently. Not as your enemy, but as a child of God, created in His image, loved by our Creator in the same way that we are loved. Their, their sin put on the cross just like ours was. An empty tomb giving them hope just like it does for us. They are no different than you or I. And until we start seeing them the same as us, we'll continue to try to get our own way. Admit today that you don't have the answers and you don't really even know where to look for them. Admit today that you've been trying to get your own way. Admit that you're not in control. Admit that God and God alone should direct your life and your relationships, your choices, your words, everything about who you are and what you do. And then stop running away from it. And start running towards it. Stop ignoring it. And start listening to it. And admitting that starts when you can pray for those enemies the way that Jesus prayed for his. So I want to challenge you to that today. In this moment. Maybe it's a specific individual. Maybe it's a group of people. Maybe it's just, you know, the people I work with. My neighbors. This group of people, I don't know who it is. But today I want you to take a moment and pray. God, Give me the strength to see them as you do. God, give me the strength to love them as you do. God, stop letting me run away from your word and let me start listening. Because if you don't, you're playing with fire. And it's not just going to hurt them. It will come back to hurt you as well. Start asking God in this moment to soften your heart and let you think of those people differently. And when we do that, is when we finally start to embrace that God is in control, even of the places that I don't want him to be, even with the people I don't want him to be. And that's when we get to see God, his fire, really wash over us and really start to change us and move us. Take a moment and pray for those people today. Pray for yourself today that you would begin to listen to and heed the word of God in every area, in every relationship, and everything in your life. Let's pray together.
Father God, we come to you today. And we ask that you would give us the strength and the humility to admit and embrace that you are God and we are not. And that we've tried to be in control of our own path and our own hearts and our own lives. And we've tried to be in control of other people and we have failed at it miserably. God, free us from hatred, from bigotry, from judgment, from all those things that cause us to see people differently than you do. And help us to hear your word. That you have come for them just as you came for us. That you have life for them just as you have life for us. That our battle is not against them. But there are powers and principalities in this world that are much greater than them that are our enemies. May we stand together against them. May we fight them in their lies, in their hatred. And may we embrace your love. May it change us. May we listen to your word. May you let it speak to our hearts. May, may it change us more into your image. May we not run away from it. May we not ignore it, no matter how hard it may be. May we embrace it. May you allow it to change us. May we live by it. In every day, in every relationship. We pray today. that your word would become what we run to first. That it would become what we listen to first. What would become what we trust in first. May nothing else come before you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We sing this song today that just proclaims there's no one but you. Because throughout this journey of the kings, we see all of them trusting things other than God. All of them running to things other than God, other than running other places other than God. And today we want to stop that in our lives. And say there's no one but you who can soften our hearts and change our lives. No one but you. So you stand with me and we're going to sing this today. Whether you don't know it, just read the words and let it be the prayer of our hearts. May it be a prayer of praise. May we give glory to God for his word, for his truth.